Oh, making a triumphant return to the show. And a man, by the way, who is just a, his 10th NFL training camp, 10th Eagles training camp, Bleeding Green Nation, the one, the only, the extremely tall and devastatingly handsome, I might add, Brandon Lee Gowden. What's up, Brandon? Mark, I can't believe it's been 10 years already, but uh, it's a good time. You know, there's been a lot of, seen a lot of things over just 10 <laughs> years. And obviously, I'm hardly one of the most experienced uh, or longest tenured guys on the beat. But, uh, you know, it's an honor. Glad to be yeah. here. Yeah, 10, I mean, 10 years regardless, doing anything is an accomplishment. I mean, I'll say that. So let me ask you, what was your, I know you always ask this of athletes. We always ask this of athletes, but like, what was your welcome to the NFL moment? What was your moment like, oh, wow. Okay, this is the real deal. I'm here at training camp. I'm covering the the pros. What was that moment for you? So uh, the one of the most memorable things ever from an Eagles training camp didn't have to do so much with the Eagles as much as it. Well, I mean, there was the Riley Cooper thing. I, well, I can mention that really quickly. <laughs> oh, oh, that thing? <laughs> yeah, that right, really quickly was, you know, like something that certainly wasn't normal. But another thing uh, that really stood out was just Tom Brady when he came to uh, Eagles training camp in 2013. And I'm like, whatever, no big deal. It's Tom, so what? It's Tom Brady. I don't care. Whatever. I don't, I'm not, you know bowing down to his greatness or anything but he was so amazing i i can't i n never seen a quarterback in a practice look as dominant as he did and i hate to admit it because i'm not a brady fan by any means but like he was really freaking good so uh it was probably then uh, i can i can remember being in a gillette stadium and being at a press conference with him for, for the first time and it was probably around that same time and it was after a sunday night football game and i just remember thinking like that's the greatest ever that guy right there is the greatest ever. Like it just kept on repeating in my mind. Um, but uh, yeah, I can uh, I can identify with the. It, it, we don't root for him by any means, but I hate the term. But goat, goat all the way. Uh, when you fast forward now to the present day, uh, we have a little bit of a I don't want to say a quarterback controversy by any means because it's not like Gardner Minshew is coming up here to take his spot or anything like that. But when it comes to Jalen Hurts, I look at him as a guy that's in a very similar situation as he was last year in terms of pressure on him for what this year means for the rest of his football life, or at least with the Philadelphia Eagles. Do you see it as that as something similar where he was competing to be the guy for the foreseeable future and is doing that again this year? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, his contract is not up after this season, but do you really want to go into 2023 with like a lame duck quarterback? I think, you know, what's the Eagles MO? They want to sign guys early. They've done that time and time again. They don't wait. They don't put the franchise tag on players. They want to know their core guys and get them signed the long-term contract extensions, because there's an advantage to doing that. You're beating the market to the punch. Obviously, you're, you're taking on some risk, and maybe you're assuming that player might be a little bit better uh, than they have proven to be. You're putting some faith in them. That's kind of the, you know, the, the risk-reward and the deal there. But So absolutely, I think there's pressure on Jalen Hurts in that regard. And then just the reality, too, of you know how many more off-seasons are the Eagles going to have an extra first-round pick like they do next year. So uh, I absolutely think there is that pressure on him. And I have to say, you know, through, tr through training camp so far, I don't think he's done anything to, like, move significantly closer to being that guy. Now, again, it's just camp. There's a whole season to play out, and that'll – go a long way in determining his future but right now uh not quite mm -hmm. uh by the way we are we are taping this on uh tuesday just for people just for clarity uh but w when it comes to jalen hurts then in your 10 years is there a guy that made you buy into either training camp stats or training camp performance or preseason performance that you thought oh wow this guy impact player when the actual season starts and then it turned out to not really go that way well, the value of training camp, yeah, is, is interesting to talk about. I do remember Carson Wentz, and I don't think this is just revisionist history. Like, he looked on fire in that 2017 training camp. And that's not to say he was perfect. I'm sure there could have been a bad practice or two in there, some inconsistency. But more often than not, it was like, wow, this guy is clearly making a big jump from year one to year two. And by contrast, I remember Carson Wentz ahead of 2020 dealing with a lot of accuracy issues, and I didn't fully know what to make of it at the time. I'm like, maybe this doesn't mean a whole lot, but sure enough, it did. And to this day, now he's with the commanders. We're still hearing about him having accuracy issues in training camp. So I absolutely think there's meaning to it. You know, I, I think uh, Nick Foles has brought up in this example, maybe not the best barometer of a guy, how he performs in training camp, how he performs in the games. But also Nick Foles, to me, is a very anomalous player who has, has obviously has high highs and low lows. So I think it, there is value in it. And again, uh, Hertz has not been in a spot where I think he's had way more good days than bad days. So, you know, I don't think that's what you want to see. No, I'm a thousand percent with you there. Uh this week we get the horrible news. Well, not horrible news, but the news about Jason Kelsey and the fact that he's going to be missing some time. I, I don't think he'll miss the first week of the season. He's got a history of obviously fighting through a lot throughout his career. 
What are you making of the news of Jason Kelsey and what are the Eagles going to do without him for the next couple of weeks? With any kind of you know injury like this, any kind of situation where the team is like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. He's getting surgery, but it's not that big of a deal. And you have to have some level of skepticism. You can't just be like, well, the team is definitely – uh, telling the truth and not that I'm saying the Eagles are liars. I'm just saying across the board, when you see injuries like these in sports, you know, the team might kind of uh, be a little bit generous in terms of like the time they're not going to miss. And sometimes it's worse than they make it out to be. So that's always on your radar. It does sound like based on all the reports that he won't miss time, which is really good. But I mean, it's not great necessarily that he could be entering the season, you know, coming off of some lack of conditioning and obviously um, just not having the full gelling and like it getting all the reps he normally would with Jalen Hurts. Is it the biggest deal in the world? I don't think so. But also, I can't help but wonder, OK, is this issue going to go away once he has this procedure and is it going to just be in his past? Or is this something that might flare up again? And if that's the case, I know Cam Jurgens is here, and I think he's had a good training camp and you know could potentially be a nice future starter for the Eagles and might be able to be a decent fill-in for this year. But you're talking about a player in Jason Kelsey, who is a leader of the team, a team captain, and a four-time All-Pro in the last five years versus a rookie who doesn't have you know a rapport with the starting quarterback uh, the way that Kelsey does, obviously, with Jalen Hurts. So uh, not pressing the panic button, but also like, you know, a little bit more concerning than 0%. Brandon, real quick, I just want to show this video of Cam Jurgens getting owned by Jordan Davis. What did you make of that power? So I think, uh, I mean, that offensive line Twitter t- ran away with that and was like, well, actually, you know, it wasn't even that bad of a rep because, uh, you know, he kept him in front of him and everything. And it's a one-on-one drill. And obviously defensive linemen are going to have uh, more of an advantage in there because there's no actual quarterback who can get the ball out really quick. Um, but I, I do think that speaks to Jordan Davis's power. I mean, he's just clearly he's huge and not only huge in like, I like to make the distinction. He's not like fat. You know, I think a lot of people, you think of a big guy, like, you know, big gut or like, you know, really like stocky. He looks pretty sleek as much as like a guy who is six, six, three thirty pounds can be um, very athletic. And that shouldn't be surprising. He obviously tested incredibly at the combine. So uh, I, I think, you know, again, Jordan Davis has done some really nice things. You're seeing the power that he has not only, does he have the ability to clog up the run, but he can get in the backfield too. He can kind of push the pocket and rush the passer, which is everyone was concerned about with him. But I think Jurgens on the whole too has done a lot of good things. There've been reps where he's held up against Jordan Davis. So I think the fact that those guys are having good battles is a good thing all around. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Uh, we've, we've heard a lot about AJ Brown. We've heard about Jordan Davis. Uh, we've heard a little bit about Nicobe Dean, but is there a guy that's kind of off the radar that has grabbed your attention through what uh, nine nine training camp sessions to this point? Nine training camp sessions, almost just over halfway. They're going to have sixteen total, including the four joint training camp practices, both against the Browns, which are next week, and then the Dolphins after that. I would say Nicobe Dean has not really stood out at all, um, mm. which is not like the end of the world because he's a rookie. <laughs> but I would like I just want one flash from him, and I don't, and we haven't seen that, and. Meanwhile, we've seen T.J. Edwards have a really good summer. Davion Taylor, who's kind of been a forgotten guy here, has made plays. Kaiser White, with Eagles signed in free agency, he's made some good plays as well. And then even Sean Bradley, I think he's had an interception or two in training camp. So there's at least four, four training uh, four linebackers who have shined ahead of Nicobe Dean in training camp. So I'm not pressing the panic button him on any means either, but I just think, you know, for people – expecting big things out of Nicobe Dean in year one. Maybe pump the brakes on that a little bit, and that doesn't mean he can't have a good career. It just means I don't know how much he's going to be a day one contributor. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would definitely pump the brakes on that. In terms of other guys who have stood out, you know, I kind of look at the guys who are on the back of the roster fighting for a spot, especially when it comes to the return game. I mean, Jason Huntley, he's my guy. I've been on on the Jason Huntley train for a while now. It's kind of a bit I put out there. But also, like, he's good when he looks explosive when he has the ball on offense. He's their best kick returning option. When was the last time the Eagles had a good kick returner? Also, when was the last time the Eagles had a good punt returner? It's really, you know, Darren Sproles, but that's been a while now. And Britton Covey is kind of a guy who Nick Sirianni was praising and I think could potentially make the roster as a sixth receiver. Maybe he's the fifth guy if they are able to trade Jalen Rager. So I'm looking at those return spots as the guys uh, kind of both that we've seen throughout camp who have showed potential, but also going to be wanting to watch in the preseason games. I went over it the other day, the Eagles unofficial, super unofficial, made by the PR staff depth chart, and I saw Jalen Rager as the kick and punt returner. Mm. And I was like, okay, I don't think it's going to happen, but if they're going to fight for the idea of holding on to a first-round pick, I don't mind them in that spot as much. Yeah, I mean, I, I would like the Eagles to move on from Jalen Rager if they could. I think it's just it's, – it's honestly in the best interest of everyone involved. I think Jalen Rager – 
could afford a fresh start. And I don't think he's had, uh, let me say, I, I think he's actually had the best camp. That's also a very low bar because he's had some bad camps or at least been invisible in camp the, his first couple of years here. But he's made some good plays. There have been also a number of plays still where the ball is being thrown towards him and it's an interception or a pass breakup, and I don't think that's totally unrelated. So by no means do I think he has he like totally turned the corner and now you have to keep him around. I think it's a situation where the deals are kind of hoping that, okay, he's, there's some better press out about him. Now hopefully maybe we can trade him. We can get off of some of that money we owe him and get something back in return and then open that roster spot up for someone maybe like a Britton Covey. Gotcha. Uh when it comes to this receiving core with A.J. Brown, how much does it elevate the rest of this offense when you already have weapons like Dallas Goddard, you already have Devontae Smith, Miles Sanders, and uh, Kenny Gainwell out of the backfield? How much does it elevate having a talent like that? I mean, A.J. Brown is going to lead this team in targets. It's, it's no secret. Jalen Hurts loves throwing the ball his way. And uh, can't blame him because he's a really good player who can – win in a number of different ways. He had that big play at the link that everyone saw, able to fight for the ball, even though like, it wasn't, I don't think it was a bad pass, but it wasn't necessarily a perfect pass. He was able to go up and make a play on that. Um, been a real big weapon on slant routes in practice, and you can just see, you know, it's obviously they're not doing live tackling in practice, but still for him to be able to get the ball in the middle of the field and just be able to take off running and be able to fight through contact like he can, like you see he can. I mean, he's going to make a big difference for this offense, I feel like, just in terms, too, of think about all the attention that is going to go his way that should, in theory, open up more targets and more opportunity for Devontae Smith and Dallas Scott are in the right situation. So it's, it's a huge deal. What are you making of Miles Sanders? There's a lot of – it's. I mean, I hate to use the word, but it's like there's controversy surrounding mm -hmm. him going into this year. What do you think comes out of it for Miles Sanders after this season? Really big year for him in terms of, you know, his, his contract is up after this season. And I don't know that the Eagles are really looking to invest big resources into a running back. That's not how they operate, at least in terms of money. Obviously, they spent a second round pick on Sanders. But uh, I think he's had a really good camp as, in terms of a runner. He clearly looks way more explosive than any other running back on the team, which shouldn't be a surprise. But, you know, for drills where the defense can't actually tackle him and the running backs are always going to, you know, look decent because they, they can't get stopped. Uh, he looks really good. Still don't think he's earned that trust as a pass catcher, which is a problem and impacts his playing time overall. The big question about Miles Sanders isn't like, is he talented? He clearly is. That's not up for debate. The question is, can he be a volume runner? Because, you know, these guys at the top of the league at that position, like Derrick Henry, Zeke, whoever you want to name, they get the volume too. And part of that is because they can be counted. Well, part of it is they're so, so special as running backs, but also because like you can't, you don't want to take them off the field. And because Sanders kind of has some question marks there from what he can contribute as a pass catcher, that's going to lead to Kenny Gainwell and maybe Jason Huntley or Boston Scott, whoever getting, you know, sharing the playing time to some extent. I still think Sanders is clearly, you know, the top guy there, but is he going to be a 20 carry a game guy ever? Like, I think he can kind of, make his case for that if he can you know catch the ball and, and be really productive and everything and stay healthy but that much he has to answer still mm. this is the big question that everyone's going to be looking for after mm. this season and it really has to do all about the quarterback and Jalen Hurts do you think he will get another year at least one more year being the Eagles starting quarterback meaning they will most likely sign him to a multi-year deal if that's the case do you think he will earn another contract with the Philadelphia Eagles when it's all said and done and all the, all that's been added and all the hard work he's put in and all that. Do you think he will be good enough bottom line to play again for the Eagles after this season? I don't think so. I think it's a really high bar that the Eagles will hold him to like, look, the Eagles, they want to pass the ball. It's not a secret. And I think Jalen Hurts brings a lot of positive things to the table with his running ability. I think he's improved in some regards as a passer in terms of he's working the middle of the field more than he did last year in camp. A.J. Brown's helping a lot with that. But you're not seeing a night and day difference from this player. You're not seeing like, oh, yeah, this is the guy we definitely want to give all this money to. And by the way, once you do give him that money, this stacked roster that everyone likes to talk about that is a really good support system around him, you're not able to – like retain that as easily because you're having you're using those resources that you're building up the roster to instead spend on the quarterback. So I just don't think he's that kind of player who is a win because of quarterback as much as he's kind of like a win with player who's along for the ride and doesn't mess things up. And, they, and there's value in that in terms of you know you can you can be a playoff team like the Eagles were last year. But at some point 
you want the ceiling to be more than just a playoff team and you want to be actually able to compete with the big boys for the championship. I was just talking about Tom Brady at the top of this segment. Like you, you need a guy who's going to be able to compete with the elite quarterbacks. And I don't think we've seen anything from Jalen Hurts thus far that indicates he can. Mm-hmm. Uh, here's my thing. I, I, I think he does earn that deal. And uh, just to be full disclosure here, uh, I just, I, it's hard for me to bet against the guy with a, with a great work ethic and hard to bet against the guy that's going to have those weapon, be, weapons around him in year two as a starter. That's where I'm at with Jalen Hurts. Uh, two quick ones for you. Overall expectations for this Eagles team. We haven't even played a preseason game yet. But what's your somewhat early prediction for this season for Philadelphia Eagles? Yeah, I mean, their schedule is so easy. And, you know, that, that, that sometimes that only means so much because if you're not any good, then okay, it doesn't matter if you have a great schedule or easy schedule. But I think from what we saw last year, for all the criticism that's out there, and I think rightfully so to this point about Jonathan Gannon, can he actually not get destroyed by a good quarterback? Because that happened every time they played a good border, quarterback basically last year. And he took care of the not good ones. And they have a lot of not good ones on the schedule this year. So I think the defense is going to be able to hold up, especially because they've add, added some pieces. They're getting Brandon Graham back, who has looked great in training camp, maybe like better than he ever has. He's looked he's re- looked really good. So, And I think the offense, you know, um, while they haven't looked good in camp, I think there's a floor there because of Jalen Hurts' rushing ability, because of A.J. Brown and the playmakers that they have here in the running game. I think there's there's a certainly a floor with this team that I, I believe in, and that's why I think I would not to you know do whatever you want with your money, but I like the over. I think the over, uh, I, I feel decent about that. Um, but I, again, I question the ceiling. That's what it comes down to. I, I just don't know if this team really has what it takes to go on a deep playoff run if they don't have a high-volume elite kind of or at least very good passing offense and they have not had that yet with Hertz and I've not seen anything to make me believe that's going to change in a big way okay fair enough uh to switch subject here because I know you're a man for all seasons particularly basketball and again we're taping this on Tuesday night and uh, we just recently learned about Ben Simmons and allegedly leaving a chat with the Brooklyn Nets are you enjoying laughing at the Brooklyn Nets as much as I am am I just being a selfish jerk like what are you making of, of what we have learned this week I just, I was never the biggest Ben, not to say I was like right all along or anything, but like I was never the biggest Ben Simmons. I can genuinely say that I was never the biggest Ben Simmons guy. And all this is just very unsurprising to me. I'm like, yep. It's it's kind of validating to see like people coming around and, oh yeah, like this guy is not the guy. Hmm. Yeah, it certainly seems like, and could we have a better replacement for him than Tyrese Maxey, who seems to be the (laughs) polar opposite of him? I, I Ty, Tyrese Maxey is like barely real in terms of like he's just like everything <laughs> you want him to be. How the how the Sixers got him is incredible with the Mike Muscala like hitting a shot in the you know the in Disneyland like it's, it's just or Disney World. It's just so crazy. He's he's unreal. He's great. Um, I don't know like is the, he's he's up there in Philadelphia sports history like with athletes who like are infallible like that everyone loves that no one like even some of the most popular athletes you can easily find like detractors for them but i i don't think there's a like i don't know if there's a single tyrese maxi detractor out there <laughs> i don't think i've ever used this phrase for any athlete ever he's a sweetheart he's a damn <laughs> sweetheart is what he is uh no i couldn't agree more with you on, on maxi and your uh your, your ben simmons takes as well uh brandon lee gowden bleeding green nation congratulations 10 years Training camp for you, my friend. Uh, I, I couldn't be happier for you, man. It's uh, I'm sure it's been a fun ride for you. Thanks for joining us on the show today, man. Much appreciated. Thanks for having me. The great Brandon Lee Galton joining us.